Welcome to Positive Read-Ins. Recently, the New Zealand government has decided to withdraw its funding for a popular annual Shakespeare festival for high school students. This festival uh, apparently is quite popular and it gives high school students the opportunity to put on various um, Shakespeare plays that, they, that the high school students uh, direct and perform. The governing body's reason for withdrawing funding uh, came down to a decision which they said that uh, Shakespeare is, quote, uh, the canon of imperialism. This is not the first time Shakespeare has been challenged and certainly will not be the last, uh, though it's probably one of the, the weaker um, reasons to challenge Shakespeare. I'm not going to talk today about uh, New Zealand's uh, choice of to, to not fund this, this festival. Uh, I'm guessing that um, the Shakespeareans hold nothing against uh, New Zealanders. And uh, I'm, I imagine many New Zealanders uh, also find it a bit bizarre not to support uh, the, the reading or performing of Shakespeare. What I actually want to look at today is a much more robust criticism and challenge against Shakespeare, and in particular, um, what many people think of as Shakespeare's greatest play, which is King Lear. So what I'm going to look at is actually coming out of this uh, collection of George Orwell essays. Uh, Orwell has an essay in here called uh, Lear, Tolstoy, and the Fool, and in this essay he looks at how Leo Tolstoy um, challenged later in his life, uh, challenged the work of Shakespeare. So for me, this is an interesting history that has kind of been overlooked. Uh, many people know who Leo Tolstoy is, obviously a famous Russian writer, um, but they probably didn't know that unlike many people and many English teachers, he did not support uh, or did not, did not support William Shakespeare, did not think he was a great a uh, great writer, great poet. Uh, Leo Tolstoy is no slouch, however. Uh, he claims to have read Shakespeare's entire body of work three times throughout his life, uh, and each time he read them in a different language. So uh, in Russian translation, in English, and I think finally in German translation. Uh, he said that as he went through and uh, reading, uh, reading this, these works, he kept thinking that, oh, there must be something wrong with me because I don't see the greatness in, uh, in Shakespeare. This is the story that, that Orwell tells us. Uh, so finally, in uh, Leo, uh, Leo Tolstoy's old age, he decided that, no, I'm not wrong here. It's the world that's wrong, and I'm going to write about it and, and tell them why. So it's a pretty interesting uh, story already that we're getting here, and mediated through George Orwell. And Orwell uh, appraises, um, appraises Tolstoy's arguments and, uh, and, and lets us know which, which ones are strong, which ones aren't, and, and, and that's what we're going to focus on today. So for starters, Tolstoy uh, attributes much of Shakespeare's popularity and fame really to what he calls an uh, epidemic of suggestion, meaning everyone around is saying, well, this is so great, and therefore everyone believes it's great. I don't think this is necessarily a bad argument. I, I would imagine there are lots of artists today uh, who are popular simply because word of mouth gets around, people say they're popular, and everyone feels like they have to read them and, uh, and, and also agree. So that in itself, I don't think is uh, incorrect, but let's look more at his argument. He starts off by uh, looking at Lear and uh, saying that, well, the characters in Lear, the situation, they're just ridiculous. They're absurd and uh, they don't make any sense. Uh, one of the ways, uh, one of the things he says here, I'll read, he says that, uh, uh, Tolstoy adds, it is not merely no genius, so no genius that, that Shakespeare has, but he says, but it is uh, not even an average author. Okay, he's not even an average author. 
So Tolstoy uh, then makes a sort of exposition of the plot of King Lear, finding it at every step to be stupid, verbose, unnatural, unintelligible, bombastic, vulgar, tedious, full of incredible events, wild ravens, mirthless jokes, anachronisms, irrelevancies, obscenities, worn out stage conventions, and other faults, both moral and aesthetic. Now, uh, that sounds pretty harsh. Uh, in response to this, Orwell says, well, I think uh, you're, 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 you're sort of right. He says that uh, Lear, uh, King Lear, is, is not a great play as a play. I and mean, that's not why uh, it's continued to be read uh, over and over again. It's, um, Orwell acknowledges, he says that, you know, I think, you know, we didn't need two evil daughters. One would have been enough. We don't need Gloucester and Edgar. I might disagree with that, but this is what Orwell is saying. So he's saying, so he's, he's conceding this point. Yeah, it's not a great play, but that's not why it's being read. So that's, that's the first point and response uh, from Orwell. Uh, the second point that, um, that Tolstoy makes is uh, really uh, involving, involving the plot, specifically involving what happens with Cordelia uh, and, and Lear at the end of the play. Tolstoy, uh, again, is no slouch. He has a standard, uh, a rubric in which to apply to great works and decide whether they are great works of art. So uh, he gives us a theory of art, or rather Orwell summarizes his theory of art, and I think it's um, worth reading. So let me just read this here. So uh, he says, a great work of art must deal with some subject which is, quote, important to the life of mankind, end quote. So that's one factor. Second, it must express something which the author genuinely feels. And thirdly, it must use such technical methods as will produce the desired effect. In itself, I don't think this is a bad um, theory of art. I mean, it's not much of a theory. It's just kind of saying that, okay, uh, it needs to be important to people. It needs to be relevant in their lives. It needs to be um, important to the author, express something that the author genuinely feels, not something like uh, um, uh, an argument they're trying to put out. I think this is where a lot of contemporary literature goes wrong on that second one. And uh, it needs to be expressed in, in a method that is suitable for, uh, for the for, for the, the content. Um, Susan Sontag would argue that uh, largely that's gonna, those things are gonna be working together. The author isn't gonna have much, well, the author does have choice in it, but they're gonna be, uh, the content is gonna dictate the form to some degree, and the form's gonna dictate the content. But that's another story. So, uh, so this is, this is uh, Tolstoy's argument for what literature is. And, and, and if you can see, though, much of this, and this is actually also brought up by Orwell, as he said, well, much of this really is, can't be proven. Um, Orwell tells us, uh, here, I'll just read this. He says, in reality, there is no kind of evidence or argument by which one can show that Shakespeare or any other writer is good. Nor is there any way of definitely proven that, for instance, Warwick Deepin is bad. And we don't know who Warwick Deepin is, at least I don't, and I think that could be, and this is going to anticipate the next argument on why we can assume he is bad or was bad. Here we go. Orwell says, ultimately, there is no test of literary merit except survival, which is itself merely an index to majority opinion. So survival is what makes the great work of art, a great work of art, the classic. This is uh, very similar to what J.M. Coetzee says decades later when he writes his uh, essay, What is a Classic? And he's saying that a classic is something that survives time. But uh, related to this essay, um, J.M. Coetzee also tells us that the classic needs to be challenged and needs to survive harsh criticism. And that's what we have here. Tolstoy is offering the harsh criticism and, uh, and Orwell is showing how it did not survive, okay? So uh, both Tolstoy, Shakespeare, or well, Tolstoy and Orwell, they're all, they're all uh, part of this def uh, definition of what a classic is. They're, they're taking part in this maybe dialectic to decide what the classic is. So getting back to our, the, the weakness uh, related to this, um, this, this, this point here, uh, Tolstoy is arguing that 
the end of this play is unsatisfactory, right? Um, he actually says that it is, uh, he calls it, quote, uh, well, he says that the original King Lear, which, as you, got, as you probably know, many of Shakespeare's plays are based on uh, other plays that were around, and that he would he would change change them to, uh, to suit his uh, his audience, his tastes, uh, maybe comp uh, make them more complex in a lot of ways. Uh, but so, uh, according to Tolstoy, the original one, the original King Lear, was better, and he said that it terminates more naturally and more in accordance with the moral demands of the spectator than does Shakespeare's, namely by the King of the Gauls conquering the husbands of the elder sisters, and by Cordelia, instead of being killed, restoring Lear to his former position. So that, that was the way the original play ended, and according to Tolstoy, this is the better way to end it. And I should just note here that Tolstoy is, uh, is not alone in believing this. Uh, after, after Shakespeare's version was, was uh, performed and published, uh, for many years, hundreds of years actually, uh, there was, uh, it was performed with having this happy ending, with having Cordelia stay alive, right? So uh, Orwell, though, or Orwell does not agree with this argument, and uh, it's interesting the way that Orwell um, responds to this. Orwell looks at Tolstoy's argument and says, well, you know, Tolstoy has a religious, a, a Christian view uh, worldview in which he thinks that uh, good needs to conquer evil. That's the moral demand. Uh, but according to Orwell, he argues that Shakespeare does not have this view. Shakespeare has what he calls a humanist view. And in the humanist view, well, the, the good does not always conquer. And by that, by not conquering evil, by the good man losing, that is what makes the tragedy tragic, according to Orwell, and I would agree with him there. The final argument that Orwell provides to respond to, to Tolstoy is a bit more complicated. He looks at the fact that Tolstoy, uh, in his later age, uh, did go through a, uh, a strange transformation where he became very devout and uh, very stern in his kind of beliefs, trying to relinquish all uh, possessions, and, and also kind of expecting others to, uh, to, to kind of to follow his way, uh, his austere form of, of living. Now, um, in doing so, Orwell argues that Tolstoy uh, probably saw more of himself in King Lear than was comfortable, um, and that might be true. I don't agree with Orwell when he claims that this is why Tolstoy, uh, you know, why, why is he going so harshly at King Lear? Uh, I actually think Tolstoy gives a pretty good reason for writing about King Lear. He claims that, well, this is the play that's held up as the great play by William Shakespeare, so this is the one I'm going to look at, right? That's your steel man argument. So I commend Tolstoy for doing that, uh, but I do also think that Orwell has a good point here that, um, yeah, maybe, maybe there was some discomfort in seeing yourself uh, in this tragedy, seeing that your life is also becoming uh, tragic. As a final point to wrap up, Orwell lets us know or lets his opinion out that uh, he does not believe that, uh, that Tolstoy really understands the language, uh, the English language, uh, and that's why he could not really enjoy Shakespeare as, uh, as other readers do. Uh, Orwell, uh, obviously, um, was you know, a, a great uh, celebrator of British culture and English language. Um, so he ends with, by, by t letting us, uh, by giving this perspective. So I'm, I think it's worth reading. He says, uh, of course, it is not because of the quality of his thought that Shakespeare has survived, and he might not even be remembered as a dramatist if he had not also been a poet. His main hold on us is through language. However deeply Shakespeare himself was fascinated by the music of words can probably be inferred from the speeches of Pistol. And it goes on from there. But I think this is a great, uh, a great observation that yes, uh, the plays themselves 
maybe they're not the great thing, right? We don't go and read Shakespeare for uh, these these great uh, stories necessarily, but for the language that is being used, for the ways that these characters speak, um, and, and that's really the the magic of Shakespeare, and that's why uh, he has shaped the English language as much as Harold Bloom often gives him credit and, and many others. So uh, as you can see, um, and as we know, uh, hundreds of years later here that, uh, that we're still reading Shakespeare, uh, I don't think the, the choice for the New Zealand government to uh, not to sponsor Shakespeare and, and many others who say we need to decolonize our, our, our bookshelves I don't, I don't think this is going to have a great impact on the great works, and we will still be reading them. Uh, but we need to have, I don't, uh, I also don't, um, I, I welcome, I welcome these types of criticisms because this is really what's going to make the classic. Uh, so you should welcome them as well. Thanks for watching. If you like this, please uh, subscribe and like it. And remember, reading and writing are choices, so let's make them.